thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm delighted to present. You said I've been coming here a long time. I think I gave a seminar in 1997. And that was, I think, the first time I came here. So that's a sobering thought. Um, that actually launched SimFloat. So I'm not sure whether to say that as if it was a good thing or a bad thing. But it was certainly a thing. Um, of that there is no doubt. I've got rather a large canvas that I'm attempting to cover today and, and by its nature what I'm talking about I really can't go into any depth which is a really good excuse for the higher probability that I say something that I'm pretty sure is about right but I just say it damn wrong. There's a hell of a lot of stuff I'm going through and the simple truth is I'm in busy writing this up at the moment and that's quite challenging. But I haven't let the write-up get in the way of the use of it, and I've done quite a lot with this. It's predictively quite powerful and extends quite a lot beyond what I'm actually going to show you today. So I'm feeling like what I've got, I'm almost like sharing a story with you more than anything else. So we're going to walk together on a little journey, and most of the people here work primarily in the application and, dare I say, empirical space. You know, there is a, an empirical part of, I mean, a... Uh, a, 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 a part of the uh, empirical space that's reasonably respectable, um, although your colleagues up the road won't always agree to that. But I'm going to sort of take us on a walk from there, and, and we really are going to go down the rabbit hole. And uh, the more I've been going down the rabbit hole over the last few years, the deeper it's got. And at one point I wasn't sure that I would ever emerge. Um, but nonetheless, it's interesting down there, and I've, I've noticed a lot of things and gradually started to assemble them into what I now feel is a theory, uh, a, a solid theory, um, although I would hesitate to say that I can write it up right now well enough to put it in the journal, the sort of journal where I feel I want to put it. So, where's this intriguing title come from? Well, on my journey down the rabbit hole, I started to encounter all sorts of interesting things, and in particular, um, a number of years ago, I bumped into all of Richard Feynman's lectures from the 60s. What a gifted communicator he was. I mean, I was trying to work out a number of things in flow theory, and he, he articulates things so beautifully. And in particular, I loved his one particular lecture, The Flow of Dry Water, um, which is a term actually that comes from John von Neumann, uh, interestingly enough, John von Neumann is one of the key theorems I've used in the development of theory, albeit his theorem was in two dimensions, and that was later proved only in 2007 in three and indeed n dimensions. Interesting thing, my theory is n-dimensional. Oh my goodness, what the hell does that mean? I don't know. So the flow of dry water it basically says that the notion of inviscid flows, in other words, flows without viscosity, and there's a huge theory of this, is in principle a load of nonsense. The implication is, for that to be true, water has to be dry. And yet, fascinatingly, the use of Stokes' theory has huge applications, even in situations where everyone knows it can't be right. And yet it's almost always perfectly good enough to do things like predict waves on oceans, and it's almost the standard way of doing it. It's extremely good, and it's almost like a contradiction in terms. So that's my preamble. So what's the outline of my talk? Well, I'm looking at doing a little bit of historical context. So we're going to start in a really empirical space. In fact, we're going to start where I left off when I was here last time. I think, was it Parkinson? I think he was kicked off the air for 20 years. And he came back for his next interview and he said, now what was I saying before I was so rudely interrupted? So 21 years ago, what was I saying before I was so really interrupted? So that's where we'll start. We'll have a look at the P9 model because I thought that was the appropriate avenue for this particular audience. And then I'll, I'll re-articulate my problems with that model. And the thing I always feel, if you've got a problem with something, you should also have a solution. And I've talked about this with many people and I didn't get much traction, but the truth is I didn't really know what to do about this problem. So we'll discuss that a little bit. Anyway, the problem of actually encouraged me to wander down the rabbit hole. I'm then going to discuss a little bit of philosophy. And out of that philosophy, talk about building a theory, using a theory, and then we'll circle right back to the start, to the problem where it all started, and see what we see together.
So very quickly, this is froth flotation. Flotation cells. I'm looking at a flotation cell, but of course flotation cells are connected up into banks, and banks are connected up into circuits. So, for example, the cell up there, and these things are big, they burp and fart, and they look impossible to model. And I want to tell you, those features of that type of unit are exactly the reason it can be modeled so easily. All that random behavior allows it to have a very high variance, but a very, very strong average behavior that is completely predictable. So it's almost ironic. And of course, down here you can see we connect these up into banks, and then we connect them up into big circuits. So what are we doing? This is progressive concentration of an ore by selective association of particles with the gas phase. So this is adsorption. So let's, let's just make sure we're on the same page. This is what I'm talking about here, unless I say anything different. But I can tell you in principle, um, what I'm saying would generally apply to any machine. But it's easier to sort of think in the context of what I think is reasonable to call a standard flotation machine. There are lots of them out there. Wherever you go, you will see these kinds of machines. So what am I meaning by standard? Well, it will have a feed. So we're talking about a cell with a continuous feed. This model will not work if you don't discharge froth in the, such a type of cell. So in other words, a conventional cell cannot function like those of you familiar with a Bickerman test or something like that. Come on. This cell, this theory that I'm going to give you, can only function a continuous cell if it discharges slowly. So our cell will have a feed, it'll have a tail, it'll have an impeller zone. This will be a shear field. Generally, it's quite a strong shear field. It probably doesn't matter how strong it is. This will probably work just fine if there was a column cell. But the shear field makes everything much better. Far from making it more complex, it allows it to be ergodic. It allows events to happen really fast, which means it can reach pseudo-equilibrium conditions. So the assumption I'm going to make throughout everything I say is it's forced air, so it means I can manipulate air rate, and it's a CSTR, continuous stirred tank reactor. It's an ideal mixed reactor. Now there's no reason in principle I can't insert non-ideality into the physics, but generally we'll keep it simple for now. So I'm always referring to a perfectly mixed reactor. So very quickly, what that means is a CSDR, we can solve for the boundary condition and we get that very simple kinetic equation up there. The fractional split to the concentrate, if we could call it that, the recovery, is a function of the rate constant, which is typically considered first order. And it's a very simple equation like that. Kt over 1 plus ktor over 1 plus ktor, where tor is the residence time. And I'm not going to put a specific form in here. That there are a variety in the literature, but all of them would say that, yes, there's material that's recovered by attachment to the bubbles. In other words, we call that true flotation. But there's also material that is entrained, dragged with the water, that is re non-selectively recovered in some proportion to the recovery of water. And now we come to where this all started in 1990, uh, P9K. When did P9K finish, JP? About 1996, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Garay et al., and I know Emmy Manlepig, JP Franzidis were very much et and al., um, published this work that was done during P9K. And this was important foundational work because this spawned the so-called P9 model, the JK model, depending on who you speak to. And it simply posits that the K that I alluded to, the first order rate constant, can be split out into P, a potential or a floatability as it was referred to then, and S, 
which is the bubble surface area flux, which is simply the square meters of gas per second per square meter of cell area. So, per second units, but of course you really shouldn't be cancelling meters squared and meters squared, they're apples and oranges, where S is then given by six times the superficial gas velocity, which is simply the volume of gas added per square meter of cell area, and the D32, which is the south and mean diameter, which is simply the, an ensemble measurement of the ratio of DI cubed to DI squared. Now, if you look closely at that data, you'll, you'll say probably what quite a few people in the literature said, and some said it quite formally, that that was not a particularly safe conclusion. The notion that that's a straight line, because clearly we'd have to have some relationship to the origin, is perhaps a little doubtful. But of course, what was invoked was the fact that this data was gathered with a froth, and that there was a froth effect underneath all of this, and that indeed we had to account for the froth effect. So, just putting this up, I'm not going to go through um, derivations like this, but just to remind people here who should know, but probably forgotten, that what you can look at, if you've got a CSTR, the assumption for a fully mixed reactor is that, that uh, the concentration there is the same as the concentration there. If you take this, the P9 hypothesis, then that mass flow rate is given by P times S, times the mass in the cell, which is the concentration times the volume, and that then gives you a mass balance to that. That's just a pure mass balance. So that's not a model per se. Pure and simple, just a mass balance. And of course we can consider this in terms of, well, there are probably particles that are different from a continuum of um, different floatable uh, uh, floatabilities, and so we would say Ri, Pi. No problem with that. Okay, so that's all absolutely true. Now, what you do is you add some hot floats to survey data, and you can bench screen, benchmark the screen kinetics. And what Kim and I found, because I introduced the JK to this notion at the last seminar I gave, and Kim was in the audience and had just collected a whole lot of data for a PhD, and the next day we sat down together and built our first flotation model. It was literally the next day. Uh, Kim went on to do quite a lot of that during the course of her PhD, in which she produced, I don't know how many volumes of her PhD, but nonetheless, she certainly used the method to uh, a considerable extent. Now, what came out of all of that was what we call the floatability component model, which looks like this. It's the same model you just saw, except it says, no, no, rather than PI, wherever we look, almost always, there are just two fractions. One's fast, one slow, and of course then there can be non, non-liberated. So we've got two floating classes. And so you've got how much is fast, how much is slow, the rest is non, and then uh, floatability associated with that. I've put RFI in brackets because, simply put, this is wrong. It's not bad, but it's wrong, okay? And you can tell when some people start to reach around and get something to work, well, RF started to get parameterized in as if it was a feed characteristic. It's absolutely wrong. It offended me to the depths of my core of my being, but it nonetheless happened. And so we've got some uh, models that have been produced by people you and I both know that might have as many as five or six hundred parameters in them. You know, you could fit a herd of elephants once you start fitting RF by whatever class you've chosen to categorize. But nonetheless, there's no question that this particular model provides a remarkably good representation of plant data in cells and banks and cells. Remarkably good. It also provides a good qualitative link between banks. But, qualitative. You have to pretend that it's going to predict cleaners. And I'm not good at pretending, but you know, some of our colleagues were much better than I was. There was something wrong there. And I want to point out something that we've always observed. And unfortunately, Kim's not here to, in the audience at the moment, but there's a question I posed right from the beginning. If you've got something that's splitting into two classes, and they are conserved, 
And then you can take that same material and split it up into 20 classes, and they get conserved. It doesn't make sense. It can't be. If you've got something faster than another fraction, it's going to get progressively more represented, and therefore you should be seeing changes in these averages if all you're doing is taking a bin and saying, I've got 100 particles, and I'm either going to call them fast or slow. That's got to change. I mean, logically, it has to. And I couldn't figure that out. So I raised that with JK Tech, and they said, don't confuse logic with business. This is working. Shut up. Go away. So, OK. Rundi then left, went off to Metso. She was really devious. She didn't have a measured gas rate. Imagine there's a model. It's only got one thing in it called gas rate. And Rungi doesn't measure it. Isn't that sneaky? So Kim's method works quite well because she doesn't notice this problem and she's doing all the benchmarking to the batch rates. And I just felt, no, this is nonsense and I need to understand the fraud. So what's the science? Well, this is a review in a page. So you can imagine that. Uh, I'm not going into depth on this for obvious reasons, but it's fair to say the mineral processing community, uh, empirical, yes, signal-to-noise ratio in our field is getting ridiculous, to be perfectly honest. Everyone's you know, telling you what they've done and has no idea what it means or why they did it. But even amongst the more respectable Well, D weird. That was clearly my fault. Um, how can I get back in? Just here. No. This one. This open. This no. Up. Oh. Oh, yeah, that yes. one. Yes. So, mineral pricing community. Probably eighty percent chemistry that's doing anything of any consequence. The only reasonably respectable work going on in this area is the Celiers group, of which you know we have some um, re uh, representatives here, if you like, in, in one sense or another, which I would call semi-fundamental, and it's essentially taking a CFD approach to France. But that's pretty much the only real game in town. When you look at the physics community, and that's, by the way, that's just froths. And I'm going to say straight out, if you just look at a froth, you can't solve this problem come to that shortly. Physics community has also taken the view of divide and conquer. So the problem has been carved up into a million bits. Nobody looks at it holistically. No one. Because it just looks too damn complicated. So you've got people who study froths, you've got the chemical engineering science that does all the cutting edge work in gas dispersion in tanks. And mostly the physicists lean on that because you take that quite seriously in the chemical engineering industry. And very few people look at anything that puts the two together. And I'm going to say, the solution to this problem doesn't manifest until you look at it holistically. Some of the experiments that are used to characterize froths and foams, I would say were probably invented by the CIA. Because they basically amount to waterboarding a froth, where you create it and then you put fluid through it. And I'm basically going to say, actually, you know, you're, you're torturing it into confessing to whatever you would like it to confess. Whatever it's saying, it isn't what it wants to do. And so it's very misleading. So my view, the view of which I come at this problem, is that flotation is an ensemble process. The whole is more than just the sum of its parts. We need to think of the process in terms of its drivers, what it wants to do, rather than in terms of its constraints what it can do. The thing is, when we look at problems like this in the classroom, in the textbooks, it's always right, write out the partial differential equations or the differential equations, plug in the boundary condition that we all know and solve. Well, let me tell you, in the real world, you don't know what the boundary condition is. And more and more, a lot of people out there are tackling problems like this with CFD and computational methods. And that looks very respectable, except they're guessing their boundary condition. I'm going to say that in this particular problem, it's all about the boundary conditions. And I'm going to go further and show you that if you think through what the boundary condition is, there's only one solution. You solve the boundary, and it's solved. 
In other words, you write down an equation that can't be solved, makes no reference to the boundary condition which you have to select, and no one has solved that system of equations ever. I can't even write the equation down, but I've solved it just by looking at the boundary condition. So, the other key point is the true nature of, pro of a process is most likely to manifest in the wild. That's I've alluded to a moment ago. And I think that's what's put people like us in a unique position in terms of some of the work that we do that could easily become much more respectable and fundamental. When you're measuring out in the wild, like part of a culture here, it's always been part of our culture, there are a lot of people out there who've never got anywhere near equipment like what we look at. Let's look for opportunities around that. Because you will never see what I see in full-scale cells in small-scale cells. It sort of lurks there, but it's masked. In a full-scale cell, it yells its presence. So a unique advantage that we have in the sort of work that we do together. So the importance of boundary conditions versus equations. Well, let's think of a frog. So you decide, going forward, one thing we absolutely must have, Neville, is J.K. Sim frog. It's the priority of UQ, and it will be made to happen. So what do you do? You go out and get a frog, and you put it in a tank, and you sit there and look at it. You say, what's it doing? It doesn't look too happy, but I think we can model it. But in order to understand that frog, you need to go out and look at it in the wild. And a frog has basically three objectives. To feed, fight, and fornicate. Not in that order. And you're not going to pick that up by ever putting a frog in a tank or dissecting it. And I think that's a key point. The tank represents a boundary condition that completely changes the nature of the frog. And I think it's so easy to fall into that trap, especially because so many of the problems that we deal with in the textbooks have always got a very neat, obvious boundary condition. Another reference to Feynman from the follow-up paper to the title, which is Flow of Wet Water. The next great era of awakening of human intellect may well produce a method of understanding the qualitative content of equations. Today we cannot. Today we cannot see that the water flow equations contain such things as the barber pole structure of turbulence that one sees between rotating cylinders. Basically, the equations don't tell you what's going on, what the system will do. They tell you what it can't do. The boundary condition, more, to, more often than not, will tell you what it will do. So the philosophy behind the solution was to consider the difference between laws and principles. In this particular case, the physics is the, the laws of physics are not helpful. If we think of this as analogous to Einstein's field equations, someone's estimated there are 10 to the 500 solutions, which is another way of saying infinite. In other words, what we're interested in is how many paths are there through a system? Well, you just heard, 10 to the 500. So how does the system find the paths? And that's the whole area of Lagrangian mechanics and path integration. So the law defines a set of weakly dispersive partial differential equations. And many of them are very hard to solve. My proposal is that the sort of systems we're looking at will be in pseudo-equilibrium because they're ergodic. We have large ensembles that will produce a wide variance. So if you pull that couple of bubbles, you might see a huge range in what's on them, their size. But on average, <coughs> they're very robust. And that these will conform to the law of static action. In other words, the system will act so as to minimize energy. And I simply propose that it could do that. And it could do that as a result of what's known as gauge symmetry, which is to say that there are a set of relationships that are immune, if you like, to disturbance. They cooperate together to damp out any effect of changes. And so they are, in effect, invariant in translation. You change gas rate in the float cell, it stays all symmetrical. Things cancel each other out. So, building the theory, very quickly, frost geometry. So you've got 
a hexagonal, I mean a, a polygon structure. It's a mixture of all different shapes, but it can be reasonably well characterized as a Kelvin cell, and that is in turn easily described in terms of a tetrachiodecahedron. So in terms of geometry, we can use that to define some important geometric <coughs> quantities. So if we think of that shape that's characterized by a length, we can convert that length to a diameter for convenience sake. But equally, we can look at the shape of these plateau borders and we can characterize them in terms of a, a radius. So that's the plateau border area there. So that radius, that's what that implies. We've got the volume of the of a cell, we've got the area of a cell. So we come up with some geometry that relates to a cell. And so I'll derive first, uh, let me show you that there's an equation of state, adiabatic, but it's simply, this is an equation that says, this is a triangular system, and if you, you need to know the size of the bubbles, the gas flow rate, and the gas fraction, which is phi, if you know two of those, you know the third. Now you'll say, no, no, you know the gas rate. No, you don't. The volume is changing. So the gas rate is unknown. So you need to know two of those. So if you go through the geometry and look at the velocity, you can derive an equation that is the equation that would be satisfied for least action. I'm not the first to come up with this one. This was also derived by Stevenson, although then he tried to add some other things to it and didn't realize that he already got to what, in fact, should have been a result. So as is typical of an equation of state, it's a, it's a cubic expression, and you've got the gas velocity, viscosity, rho, g, the diameter, the uh, radius of the bubbles. I'm not going to go through this, but just point out, this is also straight out of textbooks. So this is the fundamental of multi-phase flows, Brennan, and this is the solution to the Navier-Stokes equations for flow around a sphere. So we start with our bubbles, and there are two, two of the most common solutions, if you like, our Stokes result, which is that the uh, that there's a uh, no that there's um, uh, lost the degree. Um, that would typically apply to a solid particle where there is shear at the interface, uh, at the interface of the particle. And then you, so that would be the, the Stokes condition that would apply to solid particles for slopes deadly. And then you've got the hadamard rabinsky which is typically considered to be appropriate for a bubble, which considers that it's a pure slip on the surface of the bubble. And the, the net effect of that when you solve the equations is that Stokes is 6 pi mu u r, and Hadamard Rabinsky is 4 pi mu u r. Well, I'm saying, no, no, I'm not interested in either of those, because as everyone knows, bubbles are very, very much affected by absorption at interfaces. In fact, uh, if you have any absorption, it will affect the rise velocity above, and it's incredibly sensitive. It's often the best way to detect that uh, contamination exists in water by the change in the rise velocity of bubbles. And that's caused by a surface tension gradient. And so we can solve for a Marangoni boundary condition, and that's just illustrated over here. All that happens is it's 4 pi mu u r plus 2 pi r squared times the surface tension gradient. And I'm going to tell you that surface tension gradient is what all the solids, they roll up that and out of the cell. It's a, it's a few hundred... Micro, uh, nanojoules per square meter and it can lift 10 tons an hour no problem because there are millions and millions and millions of bubbles it's the power of surface energy so this is actually truly nanotechnology in that sense we add a very small amount of frother and that's all that's required and the frother does that job the frother addition is so small that we can't detect it when we ch measure surface tension change and yet could lift 5, 10 tons an hour. Isn't that remarkable? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well, that's how flotation cells churn out rocks. One particle at a time. So that's core to the, the model that I'm going to show you. Now, on the right, 
And the reason I did the first one is this has got all sorts of funky geometry out of the froth in it. Now I've written the force balance for a bubble. So there's what we just discussed that I just showed you, the solution to the Navier-Stokes equations for a Marangoni uh, force balance. And there's the gravity on the right. And by a little rearrangement of terms and showing you, because you know, the thing about uh, these kinds of systems is if you know the solution, you can always check afterwards and it is a solution. You can define a length scale here which simply says 1 minus your gas fraction times r is a constant L. And you put all that together and you get this, which is exactly the same equation, except in terms of the sparse phase, if you like. So here, this now becomes that. You know, it's like the froth and the pulp are mirror images of each other, despite the fact that it's reached by a dramatically different route. And of course that means we can solve the cubic expression. If we know two, we can <coughs> calculate the third. And that allows us to know the phase distribution through the cell. The other critical factor is to recognize absorption. So the most common theory of absorption would be Gibbs isotherm. And what Gibbs isotherm assumes is that there's a layer of zero thickness. And that there's a condition represented of the bulk and a condition represented of the surface. And then this hap happens across a zero distance. It's not really realistic. So Guggenheim's more elaborate model recognizes the existence of a layer where outside that there would be a bulk characteristic, then you have the layer itself, and then you'd have the surface of the bulk. So I want to think of that in terms of R, as we've used up to now, and big R. And that's critical to how the gauge symmetry works. Now we come to boundary conditions. So these are the obvious physical boundary conditions in the cell. So you've got the lower, you've got the lower limit where you inject the gas, you've got an interface, and then you've got some notion of a discharge zone. What's typical of the Young Laplace equation, because whenever you've got an interface, you're talking with the Young Laplace equation, it's all, all, almost always true that any boundary condition itself has a boundary condition. And that is indeed exactly what manifests. So here. That boundary at the bottom, you have a behavior here. In fact, the bubble comes into existence here, and it will initially accelerate. Why? Because it's at rest or some notional starting velocity. But what it wants to do is get into free fall. Right? That's a very favorable energetic condition. And it's the one thing we know it gets to free fall because the one thing we can measure very reliably. So it goes from accelerating here but not accelerating at G, accelerating at G over 2 because of the most important force in play here. There are, there are seven, but the most important one is what's called the added mass force. So the added mass force, which is independent of all the conditions uh, according to physics, initiates acceleration at G over 2, and then sometime up here it will be in free fall at some constant velocity it will get to an interface where it goes from being spherical to coordinate into the sort of structure I showed you earlier. It can't do that instantly, and so there's a non-equilibrium zone there where it goes from spherical to coordinated. At that point, it will have a certain characteristic that will be a steady state behavior here, and then there'll be some discharge defined here in relation to the surface, the free surface. So we need to consider this in terms of those boundaries. What it transpires is that the growth rate here is a squared law. So R squared is proportional to time as it accelerates. And if the frother absorbs quickly, then it will equilibrate very quickly with a nice exponential. If the frother absorbs slowly, it can overshoot. It can go up and down, but it will equilibrate. And as engineers, we don't really care because this is going to happen in a second or so. Now, that does matter in a small cell, but it doesn't matter when you're talking about a cell bigger than this room. 
once it gets the steady state, uh, steady velocity, now, sorry, in, in that case, R, how does it conserve energy? And this is the, the general approach. So you say, well, what's the easiest thing it could do? The answer is, of course, it started off with this force, the added mass force. Well, it can't go at constant velocity. That's not possible. So the next best thing it can do is go at constant acceleration. So what it has to do is maintain the added mass force. How does it do that? Well, it's got all this frother arriving and water associating. And it turns out that those cooperate perfectly and it gets to have the mass it wants so that it stays at a constant acceleration. That gives it a little bit of time for a surface tension gradient to establish. The surface tension gradient slows the bolt down and the next thing it's in free fall. Once, and the R, the big R, is now proportional to little r because the mass stays constant. Once it gets into steady constant velocity, now what it's trying to do is r, the mass is proportional to area. P equals uh, C equals PSP. So in other words, mass is absorbed in proportion to area. That's where it will now dissipate shear. So what happens? R stays constant. This big radius stays constant and it grows inside. So the fluid velocity stays constant and the velocity stays constant. And then it gets into the froth and now you've got bubbles in close proximity and it grows to an R squared law as I alluded to earlier. So using the theory, well first thing to recognize is that we've got our equation of state. It predicts something quite simple and quite elegant. It says that a float cell won't start to work until the gas fraction at the interface reaches two-thirds. So as you increase the gas, you're transporting more and more water until two-thirds, because that's the maximum it can do. It can't go above that. The gas has got to go out, it can't get above two-thirds, purely geometric. What that means is suddenly you've got your lower boundary condition is fixed. So that one's fixed. So now, to understand the symmetry of the behavior, you ask, OK, well, the bottom one gets fixed. If we can find a reason why the top one gets fixed, we understand why we see the symmetries we do. What happens when it reaches 2 thirds is it can no longer satisfy the equation. And so, suddenly, you get a bubble bed. And then the bubble bed will exist until the bubbles grow sufficiently large that it can satisfy the equation. And it's exactly what we observe in practice. So the notion that we have an interface is already a mistake. We have a zone, and that whole zone is acting as an interface. Looking at absorption, critical part of this, and I'm going to go through this very quickly indeed, the pulp zone absorption, firstly, mostly it's water. In flotation, solids are always sparse, always. And sometimes they're really sparse. And to give you an idea, if you look at a typical bubble in a, an iron ore plant, which is about 70% floatable material, it'll have about 5 grams per square meter. In other words, there's an odd particle here and there. This is mostly water. But the solids plays a critical role. So what happens if you just have water when well, you've got frother? Water goes on the bubble, the mass stays constant, the velocity stays constant, and so this attached water gets into the froth. The attached water has a certain volume. As the froth progresses, the volume in the interstitial between the bubbles is inverse proportional to height. And there comes a height where the volume of the attached material exceeds the volume available in the froth, and it stops instantly. And if you've got water, that will happen naturally in the sense that the amount of water going in, you've got the same volume, but the velocity is now increasing as you increase gas, and so it responds in proportion to the gas rate. So, what happens with the solids? Well, the solids increase the density of the layer. The bubble wants mass, so if it's got solids, the layer thins. If the layer thins, 
the pressure in the bubble is now controlled by the density. So the bubble growth rate decreases. And the two just go into this perfect cycle. Whatever absorbs there affects the mass there and the growth rate of the bubble. And they just set each other off and create a wave where each gas ray simply superimposes a slight phase shift on what happens and the whole thing just responds linearly. And it's completely immune, bulletproof, to anything that you do until you start to push it too hard so it can't match the time constants. And that's really the only thing you can do to destroy this. And we've got quite good at it with our control systems. The other fact I just want to point out is that the theory made it very clear that our approach to entrainment was not correct. So non-selective transport into the froth, yes, but it's not water recovery you must look at. And of course my model will predict what the transport rate into the froth is, not the flow rate in the feed. Then what you'll find is there are a lot of materials that have zero flotation potential in the pulp zone perhaps usually too fine. In other words, they don't get onto bubbles. But if they get into the froth, they will participate in attachment with all the same characteristics as the truly floated particles. The only difference is, they are much slower getting there. So this is not entrainment. This is 10 times faster than entrainment, but it's 10 times slower than true flotation. I've confirmed this in a variety of places now, and it is overwhelming the key attribute of the particles you see in scavenger circuits. They're not floating at all. <coughs> Something to think about. Could we design machines better to facilitate their recovery? Because put them anywhere near an interface, and they stick. But they don't get there at a fast enough rate to contribute enough recovery. So let's get back to where we started. A Myra P9 cap. Show me this already, and we got to Ri equals Pis tor Rf. No, it's my apologies. So, constant feed to a single cell. That's how Garain ran all his tests. That means I can define the absorption field by one mean field potential. Because I'm not, I'm not taking the products. So I can just use a constant for the feed. One parameter. That's the only parameter here. It's also a zinc cleaner feed, so I can actually ignore entrainment. So entrainment will be in the result. It'll be almost negligible. You can decide for yourself. What's defining, the big question was, what's going on in the froth that made for this strange behavior that we were concerned about, logically? Well, the surface boundary condition of the model decides the relationship between PS tor and RF. Because when the froth, and think of the froth, it's just about to overflow. So all of the attached material has got to go back. What goes up must come down. Can you all visualize that? Solids going up, nothing's happening because it's not overflowing, they come back. Now you push it and it starts to flow. Well, now there's less coming back, okay? So there's less attaching because the stuff that comes back can reattach just like the stuff that's on there. So there's a little bit less. So the bubbles, the density on the attached material on the bubbles goes down. So the growth rate of the bubbles goes up. So the froth will drop back. So if you nudge a froth over a lip, it'll just drop back. If you nudge it a bit harder, it'll drop back. It can only set up an equilibrium at 33 and a third percent recover. Okay? The moment you push it over that, it gets enough time to flow and set up a 50-50 froth recovery that can equilibrate perfectly. It's the only condition that can. You carry on pushing it, get to 50%, it can no longer equilibrate there, and we have another solution for the boundary condition. And it's all related to the fact that material going up, some goes out, it has to find a way to balance the reabsorption versus the discharge. And there's a one unique solution. 
So let's have a look at that, because this is now prediction. So the cell starts to discharge a product. If it's less than a third, the decrease in the drain fraction causes a decrease in the density of the load and an increase in the bubble growth rate. The attached volume exceeds the total volume, because now it's growing faster. The froth collapses before steady state can be achieved. Cell recovery is zero. I've run plenty of cells, column cells particularly, and I've seen this behavior. You put them on, and you want a nice low flow rate, and the thing is it just keeps dying. And you have to overwind it, let it settle down, then you gently pull it back. So I've, I've seen this behavior. What happens next? Attached mass discharge is greater than a third, but less than a half. You get shear-free discharge by geodesic translation. The flow becomes a soliton. The flow becomes a soliton. And you see the flow of dry water. The gravity wave and the capillary wave exactly cancel. And you get shear-free potential for shear-free discharge. The discharge velocity is then constant, and we know that's true. This is where you get optimal selectivity. So maximum efficiency for flotation, R equals a half. That's as high as you can go. That's the best you can do. You never want to look for any other performance than R equals a half, unless you've completely messed up your plot design. Push it over 50. Now the attached mass discharge is greater than a half. The discharge is forced to accelerate. It has no choice. You have a dissipative discharge condition and you lose selectivity. So the solution at the boundary now is RF must equal R. That's the only solution that it can find to balance. And RF equals R and that gives that equation. And so there's the data and there's the fit to the data. Not a single point where there's not allowed to be a point. And I think if you consider that that's the, the sort of scatter that you see in this kind of data that's inevitable, because this is a three cubic meter cell with a variety of impellers, this big kink in the middle, I think that's rather good. I'm rather pleased with that. So froth recovery is entirely predetermined by the interaction of the absorption field and the gas ensemble in the pulp zone, and gauge symmetry takes care of the rest. I said that the selectivity would decline, and I've just put up the grade for the same data. You can see up to 50%, it's almost flat, and then wham. Dissipative discharge, much less efficient, much more water, much lower grade. This is running in the IES now. Um, with a phenomenological version and a slightly simplified version. And it's got a few advantages. It only requires a standard survey, so there's no fancy data. Um, takes about a day versus a month to calibrate. It's very easy to use. Output is much easier to interpret because this is one flotation fraction. And it's been tested on uh, two surveys so far. It fits far better than the FCN with 75% reduction in the parameters. So it's a, a pretty solid outcome. Um, there could still be a few wrinkles around the corner, but I'm quite confident it's 99% right. And I think the complete model will provide even more opportunity because that will allow essentially full digital twin capability because it's a closed solution of a problem that will give you CFD type output in real time. So it can predict the average condition at every point in the circuit, at every point in each cell, at any point in time in each cell, or any time in the past, or at any potential condition you could run, and it will do that in real time because it's a closed solution. So in conclusion, gauge symmetry. The absorption field interacts symmetrically with the gravitational field, and all the sub-processes share a common path integral. So it's like marbles in the bottom of a bowl. The more you shake them around, they move around, but almost all of them stay in the middle. It's an incredibly stable point. And it will do its best to sit in that zone of solitonary behavior, if you like, until we come along and force it out of it. So you get a robust solitonary state, and 
Unlike a single phase system, it seems that once you put two phases together, you can indeed have water behave like it's dry. Thank you very much. <laughs>